Sometimes I feel like I'm rehearsing the rapture when this goes on. I'm the only one being left behind. <laughs> we got to work on that a little bit, Nancy. Am I the only one here who finds the Apostle Paul at times just a little difficult to understand? I hope that you'll open your Bible and take a little bit of a journey with me, at least here in the beginning, to the third chapter of Philippians. I want to begin at verse 4. Take a moment, if you will, and look back across your life. Think about all of the lessons you've learned. Think about all the difficulties you've had. As I think about those questions, there are some things I would like. Well, if I had an opportunity, I would do them different. But truth be known, no, I would not do anything different. Because everything that you and I have done in our lives to this point, either as individuals, as a community, as a church, has brought us to this place today. Listen to the Apostle Paul with that knowledge in mind. And let's look at verse 4. Even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh, Paul uses the word flesh in a lot of different ways. We might think of it as ego. The way I hear him using the word in this passage is he's talking about self. Verse 4, even though I too have reason to have confidence in self. Then he says, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, if any of us have reason to be confident in our self, Paul says, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, You see, God said that he would make a great nation of Abram. He didn't say he would make Abram a great man. A nation is made of many people. In the way that you entered into that great nation of Israel was by the covenant of circumcision. He was circumcised not on, just on any day, but on the eighth day, just as Jesus was according to the law of Moses. He's a member of the people of Israel. Again, circumcision was the covenant by which they became, the people became a member of the nation of God, Israel. He's of the tribe of Benjamin. He's telling about his tribe. It's important. Think about your family history. Think about your family tree. That's your tribe. Then he says something that seems to be a little obscure until we think about it. A Hebrew born of Hebrews. We know, we know that at the exile there was a divided kingdom. Paul is trying to say, both of my parents are pure. Both of my parents, they never went to Samaria. They never practiced what the dogs practiced. They're pure. He's bragging about his self and his lineage. As to the law, 
This would be the law of Moses. A Pharisee. We talk about progressives, and we talk about liberals, and we talk about conservatives and fundamentalists as though that's something new. It's as old as time is. The Pharisees would be considered somewhat to be the progressive and the liberal party of the religion at the time. The Sadducees that were in power, fundamentalism has a way, conservatism has a way of keeping control of power. And that would have been the, the Sadducees of that time. Paul was a member of the Pharisees. Verse 6, as to zeal. Zeal for what? The zeal for God, the zeal for the church, not the church, but for the great nation of Israel. Notice what he says, as to zeal a persecutor of us, the church. In other words, everything that he had learned up to that point to be faithful to God led him to the point of being a persecutor of Jesus Christ our Lord. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. In other words, the law says thou shalt not kill, but he's blameless. And the loss of Stephen and countless other people that were martyred under Saul, Paul's leadership of the day. Now listen to all of that in context. And Paul is quite simply saying in this next transition, Yet whatever gains I had, hear him now? He's not saying how, well, he kind of is. I hear Paul saying, thanks be to God I have taken this journey. I wish that the United Methodist Church could give thanks and praise that God has brought us here to this place, and God is with us. But listen to what he says in verse 7. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. Now catch that. Paul has received something, a revelation from God that has totally turned him around. You talk about the meaning of repentance. Paul has done a 180 degree turn. Listen to him as he goes on. More than that, I regard everything as loss. Look around. And scripture says all of this will pass away. That the heavens and the earth will, they'll all pass away, but the word of God will never pass away. And who is the word of God, church? Come on, he has a name. What is his name? His name is Jesus Christ. That's his name. And the word of God will never, ever pass away. And Paul sees himself in Christ, literally. In Christ. In the same way that he saw himself a member in the nation of Israel. The same way he saw himself as one in Israel by virtue of a covenant. And what we have before us on this table is the new covenant. What does it take? to move to the place that we could say, that you could say, that I could say, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish. You were reading from the King James a little while ago. Is that, did I hear that? I thought I heard the word dung come out of your mouth. The King James says that he counts everything as dung. If you don't know what that word is, see me later. I don't want you calling the bishop on me. What does it take to get a person to that place?
And that's exactly what it means to deny self. To deny self. And all that we've accomplished and all that we've done, as wonderful as it is, because it's all brought us to this place. And so it's all good. And it's all beautiful. And church, a little while ago, I didn't mean to, but I almost tried to take away from you something holy and sacred. The look in Callie's eye a little while ago. Well, do you want us to sing the glory of pottery or not? Oh, golly. Look at the notes. Look at the notes in the bulletin. You see, the word liturgy, that's what all of this is, guys. It's liturgy. The glory of pottery comes at a particular time. The Apostles' Creed, every Sunday but on Communion Sunday, comes at a certain time. That's part of liturgy. Liturgy means, you've got the answers down here, it's the work of the people. But it's not just any work. Every Sunday when we follow this order of worship, we are going about the work of Christian people. This is the good works that Scripture calls us to. And notice in the second piece here, our work is to bring the sacrifice of praise. How do we bring a sacrifice of praise? A sacrifice of praise is when we look back at everything across the week and we count it all as rubbish in comparison to what we have on this table in front of us. We look back at everything that's happened in the week and we count it all as rubbish because we give thanks and we give praise. that God has given us life and life eternal, that God, all of those sins. Church, do we believe that Jesus forgave all sins once and for all or not? Is it yes or is it no, church? Then every Sunday when we come to that point about this sin or that sin, and we're doing it about this sin or that sin, let us count all of everything as loss. Let's count all of that as rubbish because in Christ Jesus, whatever the sin is in the moment is an opportunity to be renewed in the Spirit again and again and again and again. And in other words, it's an opportunity to make a sacrifice of praise because I believe by faith that I sin weekly. And that sin is an opportunity for me to deny myself, for us to deny ourselves, and to understand that we can praise Him because He loves us. Look at the next one. Our work is to bring the sacrifice of praise. We sacrifice hymns of praise. What was it you said a little morning when we all, that that opening hymn, when we get to heaven, but but, but it's it's our what hymn? Didn't you say it's our, our favorite? It's our favorite hymn. Why? Why is it our favorite hymn, church? It points to our eternal destination. So if we, if we stop looking back at all of the junk of the week and we look forward to the eternal destination, which do we prefer? One of us, if we'll look at our prize, we will praise Him. If we look at what we are losing, we'll all walk around, poor is me, woe is me. Next, this is, what the, this is what our order of worship is doing. We sacrifice 
hymns of praise. We sacrifice our hearts and minds in prayer. We do that all the time. You notice that when we pray and we give prayer requests, we deny ourselves. Every one of them, every time I hear us give, ask for prayer for someone else, notice what we're doing, church. It's denying self. To love our neighbor is we want to be loved. I hope that when I'm down and out, Patty, Patty, I hope when I'm down and out and I've failed, that somebody would give thanks and praise that Jesus died for whatever I've messed up. Look at what's happening next. This is our order of worship. You see, if we can deny ourselves in prayer, and we do that long enough, the next one is just natural, guys. We sacrifice our ways to be hearers and doers of God's Word. That's what Paul's doing. Paul has sacrificed himself. He's counting it all as rubbish because now he has an opportunity to be able to go out among people and tell them the good news that God loves them and that God has taken the sin of the world away. We bring the sacrifice of praise when we offer Christ to our neighbor. That's why this bulletin is put together the way it's put together. And everything we do Coach, everything we do is like running those plays on field Sunday after Sunday. We're just running the same plays over and over and over because these are the basics. And I'm going to get in trouble with the coach because he knows I never played and I know I don't know what I'm talking about. But I know this. These are the essentials. These are the basic plays of the Christian life and the way of life and we rehearse them Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And then some nut like me walks in the door. Isn't that right, Nancy? Pretty much. Some nut like, like me walks in the door and, and, and wants to change the colors around on the table. <laughs> wants to move things around in the order of worship. So what would happen, church? We bring sacrifice of praise into the house. Uh, I don't sing good. You better join me on this. Give us a note. You're going to lead us. Come on. Now. Now. Let's do it. Sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer up to you spices of thanksgiving, and we all up to you sacrifices the Lord be with you lift up your hearts repeat after me we lift them up to the Lord it is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father God 
Almighty. Now, what does all of that mean? It means that you're invited to God's table. It means that you're invited to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It means that you are invited to the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. What must we do to come to this table? You see, this is the liturgy that we say the first month, the first Sunday of every month, and it gets lost in the context, church. What does it require for us to come to this table? Only one thing. That we deny ourselves and all of our past experiences. We just deny ourselves and all of our past experiences, and we come to this table not because we deserve it, not because we've earned it, not because we're worthy of it. Why do we come to this table, church? It's because we want to be loved. We come to this table because we want to be accepted. We come to this table because we have a hunger, a hunger and a thirst that this, the things of this world and all of the programs and all the accolades and all of the achievements can't satisfy. So would you bow with me, church? Father, I give you thanks. For a man named Saul, who wanted more than anything in life to know you. Seems to me, Father, that everyone in this room has an awful lot in common with a man named Saul. I give you thanks and praise for everything that has taken place in our lives up to this point that would be within your will this morning. Might we, individually and corporately, become like that man named Saul who counted everything up to that point loss and rubbish because finally he found he found the very thing that he was looking for he found that he belonged not to just a group but he belonged to you our heavenly father he found that he was loved unconditionally and Father, that doesn't make a lot of sense to the, those of us on earth because we put all kinds of conditions on the love that we share. So Father, whatever we do as we come to your table, may we come for the sacrifice of praise that you are God, that we are your people, and that when we grow up, we want to reflect your image, the very image you created us to fulfill. Through Christ our Lord, we pray as we've been taught to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.